Segregation in education. It's as bad as ever and no ends in sight. So what approaches might make a difference? What if segregation, per se, wasn't the problem? This week, educators speak out, and we visit an Afrocentric school in Brooklyn where mindfulness and race are not a detail. That's this time on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. In its landmark decision, Brown v. Board of Ed, the Supreme Court ruled that racial segregation in public schools was unconstitutional. The unanimous decision seemed to leave little doubt that separate can never be equal in education. 65 years later, however, many public schools, such as those here in New York City, remain deeply, if not more, segregated. Although new school chancellor Richard Carranza has positioned himself as the leading voice for integration, some families have begun choosing an alternative, Afrocentric, culturally responsive schools. Here to discuss how separate Afrocentric schools might not only be equal, but actually better in some respects, are Lurie Daniel Favors, an activist and attorney with a long-standing commitment to racial and social justice, Matt Gonzalez, director of School Diversity Project at the New School, Appleseed, and Rafiq R. Kalimadin founder and managing partner of one such school, the Ember Charter School for Mindful Education, Innovation and Transformation. So first, I just want to begin by thanking you all for doing this work. Well, thank Even you. just preparing for this show, I <laughs> felt so both furious and <laughs> frantic mm -hmm. and sad about the state of education mm -hmm. and inspired by the kids that come out of it nonetheless. I don't know whether it was in Michelle Obama's book or somewhere else, I read about how little margin for error there is in mm. what we That's do. Right. Yeah. Especially for kids who are already yeah. living with little margin for error. That's right. So thank you. Why do you do what you do, Lurie? Because I love black people mm -hmm. and I am a parent and I have been working in the area of culturally responsive education for almost 20 years. And I have the privilege of coming to the discipline through a program called the Freedom Schools, which is a program for the Children's Defense Fund under the leadership of former director Miriam Wright Edelman. Um, and Freedom Schools is literally modeled on Freedom Summer, on providing children who are of African descent with access to materials that look like them, that were specifically targeted for them, and that counter the social oppression that they face. And what about you, Rafiq? Why'd you do what you do? Well, I also love black people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I think, you know, I grew up extremely poor um, from Philadelphia. And my education was the one way that I was able to change my life and my siblings. Yeah. They changed our lives so substantially. So, you know, through my legal career, I had to ask myself, am I actually making my parents proud mm -hmm. by making the way more broad, right? And I wasn't mm -hmm. at a law firm, but certainly starting a school, I knew I could do that. Matt? Yeah, so, um, you know, I grew up in attending segregated schools in Los Angeles. Um, I taught in segregated schools in Los Angeles. And so I, I personally experienced the direct impact of um, disinvestment and, and educational spaces that were not specifically designed to serve the needs of, of my community. And then having to go into and, and be one of those educators who felt like I was like daily violating kind of the rights and the experiences mm. and the humanity of yeah. my young people. Mm. Um, I think that really um, helped shape my thinking about what what educational equity means and wh and mm. what what is required to to achieve these these visions and these ideals that Brown articulated and that Dr. King art articulated. So let's talk about the status quo in New York. I mean, okay. when they did the anniversary, <coughs> for the 50th anniversary, I'm thinking of for for Brown v. Board, they they talked to people in New York who said, actually, New York schools are more segregated now than they were then. Mm. Right. Uh, the statistics came out recently this spring about how many kids of color are getting into the elite, the elite schools. Seven African-Americans yeah. in a city so. that is 70% black and Latino. Yeah. What are we up against? You want to start, Matt? Yeah, so I mean, I, I think I want to just, I like to lay out very clearly that Schools that serve majority Black and Latinx students or have zero, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Um, I think what is wrong with that situation is that uh, institutions, governments, uh, 
private actors have, have again, I identified those schools for disinvestment and for kind of, um, you know, removing the value of those schools. And, you know, I think the, the kind of history of New York and up uh, northern cities have been insulated from desegregation efforts. And um, there's this kind of perception that this is all a, a southern problem. Mm -hmm. But um, because we've never had to confront these issues in New York City, um, coupled with very strategic disinvestments in schools serving uh, young people of color, and, and then very strategic policies that were designed to, to create segregation, to maintain a system of inequality. I mean, there's, you know, if you look at some of the history of this city, it shouldn't be a surprise that we're here, but I think a lot of folks in, in many aspects of our, our society have <laughs> kind of left history behind. I mean, we certainly have had integration efforts here and they provoked mass riots, sure. among mm -hmm. other exactly. things, and yeah. incredible mm -hmm. organizing. But do you think we give too much attention to this elite schools thing? Absolutely. Um, and for me, it's a, it's an effort that is tinkering with the end of a process when if you really wanted to change outcomes, you would start at the beginning. That's so right. toying with the numbers <laughs> and the final level of, of manipulative variables that we can access to get certain people into these schools is a failed policy. And when you consider that there are 1,800 other schools that are housing black and Latinx students that are not getting the attention, yeah. it's a disservice to them. Um, those seven students who got into Stuyvesant, the one student who got into Staten Island Tech, you know, there are a lot of questions now where black families are saying, is this a healthy space for my child? Mm -hmm. And having an elite label on a school doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be good or elite mm -hmm. for my black child. Well, enter Ember Charter School. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I I didn't start the school by saying, you know what we're going to do? We're going to be separate from everybody else. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I simply said, where is the community with the most need or one of the communities with the most need? And that's where I'm going to go to start my school. It just so happens that in that neighborhood, the vast majority of the children who are there who are low income, who suffer from trauma, who are suffering from generational poverty, they are black and Latinx, right? And so... I start from the premise that I'm looking to serve the highest needs kids. And I also want to make, make this also clear. My school is incredibly diverse. Yes. What we're really talking about is a lack of white students at the school. And we can have that conversation. I think yes. that level of integration and talking about that is important. But there are literally 40 plus countries and cultures represented in my school. And so when we get into conversations about diversity, I don't want to obliterate the, dias right. the diversity of the diaspora. Right. There are people who would say, yeah, but wh why not teach more Afrocentric teaching, do more Afrocentric teaching in all the schools? I would say yes. I would say they should. Yeah. Absolutely. Look, I mean, in order to take this approach, first you have to love black people, right? You have to love brown people. You have to actually think that they are worthy of being the center. And you have to tell the truth. That's right. Right. So if you actually tell the truth historically, you would tell a broader story, not just what began with the enslavement of millions and millions of people, right? But people think that that's what it's about. Right. You also would think, well, what do we need to do to help these students become powerful producers and entrepreneurs in our society? And that's not, again, that's not the focus. But haven't the statistics over the years since Brown v. Board shown that in fact, fighting segregation and integration, that period when we actually were focusing on that was the period of greatest, greatest advance even for people of color? Well, let's be precise. Um, I think during the period in which there was a widespread affirmative action, there was the creation of opportunity for black and brown people to so those, enter our economy. Those things went together. Those things went together. And so the idea was about integrating opportunity. Now, of course, being proximate to people who already had it will come along with that. Right. Hmm. And so I think that's, I want us also to kind of be really precise. When we talk about the, the Brown v. Board of Education, what they talked about primarily was it was the lack of proximity that produced inequity. Yeah. And so the strategy was, well, if we're proximate, perhaps equity then will equity will arise. Mm. Did that happen? No, you had white flight, right? right. And then you had people disinvesting from in, from these particular communities and this group of people. And even Marie. when you didn't have situations of white flight, like I often think about the uh, Little Rock Nine who are marched yeah, into yeah. the yep. building. Yep. They're, they're literally, people are hurling physical objects yep. at them. Right. They had to be under the protection of the That's armed right. guard. While the entire white community is outside literally screaming about how much they did not want those students there. And we often think about those people on the outside, but rarely do we ask what preparation or training, if any, did the educators inside that building mm -hmm. get to mm -hmm. be able to pull out the academic genius that those children brought. That's right. And why were they the point of the 
of the effort. Why and they, what's to say that the they front? weren't in agreement with the people who were outside mm -hmm. but needed to keep their position? And so when we talk about, when we look back at folk, the early scholars like Carter G. Woodson, mm -hmm. one of the, sec the second African-American person to graduate from Harvard with a PhD in education, he spends the rest of his career talking about the dangers for black people if we are not going to provide That's our right. children a culturally responsive mm -hmm. education, whether they're in a specialized high school, whether they're in an all black and Latinx charter school, if they're in the suburbs, every child should have a an education that is responsive to their culture. I mean, we should say there are a lot of specialty schools in the Uni in New York and yes. in the United States, but there's a lot in New York that focus on different things. What makes your school an Afrocentric, culturally responsive teaching specific, different, unique? So, I mean, you know, I haven't visited all the other, you know, 17,000, 1,700 schools. I haven't done that. <laughs> I've visited some. Um, so I don't know. I can talk about what we provide that I suspect they do not. First, again, we begin with this idea of how do we most empower our students with self-love, mm. self-esteem, which means you have to understand, like, how did you get here and where were your people before, right? right? right. And so that's just the truth of history, right? That's just the truth. And so I think that this is the same kind of education that everyone needs. And so we begin with that at the building block. And then we start to think about, well, how do human beings learn and develop anyway? Right. And we begin by learning based on what we believe we're capable of. And so we don't begin with that foundation, nothing else is possible. And so I think that's the difference. We have a very different center of gravity around what we teach and why we teach. But Matt, I mean, I was, I grew up in England most of my life and I went to high school there and you would never have said my high school was segregated, but it was, yeah. mm. it was just expensive. <coughs> and mm. it was in a neighborhood that was a specific kind of a neighborhood, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. mm. If we have communities that are segregated, neighborhoods, we call them communities, <laughs> but neighborhoods that are segregated, you have some that kind of have no sky, sky's the limit on where they can go, sure. and a whole lot of others where the floor is falling out beneath them. Mm. Can the school actually make a difference? Well, we actually have seen, um, especially in New York City, that you know, most, most, for many years, the mayor had really suggested that because the, we are so residentially segregated, um, we can't actually, the, the, the achievements of integration are impossible. And, I, and you know, we, I think what we know is that there's, again, there's str strategic and specific public policy designed around schools and housing that facilitates segregation. And mm -hmm. so this is not done by accident. And so um, part of what we think about for those of us who kind of advocate for integration, I, I think really want to confront this history that, that we're talking about that was traumatizing and that was painful. And that was, you know, the, these kind of visions of desegregation that were done that harmed communities of color. And I think really wanna reclaim this language, this history and this work so that it's not just about importing black and brown kids into white spaces. Mm. It's really about um, assimilating or our spaces versa. to our young people. And really, um, you know, so the framework we work from around integration is really about building equitable enrollment policies, dismantling these barriers to access like, you know, what we've seen around these specialized high schools, but, uh, but screens across the city, but also really making these deep investments in culturally responsive pedagogies, looking at discipline policies, looking at teacher diversity policies, looking at resource disparities. And I think if we're not um, having a comprehensive view of what integration can and should be, then we're going to commit the same errors that, that have been made in the past. And, um, you know, New York is a very mobile city. And so kids will, for the, the so-called good school or the school that they believe is the good school, will travel up to an hour and a half to get mm -hmm. to a school. I don't think that it should require anyone leaving their neighborhood right. to access mm -hmm. an equitable education. Um, but I do think we should support and facilitate mobility where an, an actual, like, true authentic choice because that's not happening right now, but I think we should we should honor choice and mobility, but also we need to invest, reinvest in our communities um, and, and really honor these practices that I think that we know are effective for our young people. And well, so it's there's about a lot of things, things in what you just said, and we'll yeah. get to, I hope, a lot of them, but I did want you to talk a little bit about um, Chancellor Carranza's plan. Um, they talk about something like, the, they talk about the five R's, yeah. resources, restorative yeah. justice, um, representation, relationships. Yeah, so I would, I'm, I'm hopeful that um, in the next few weeks or months, the chancellor actually comes out and says, this is his plan that he wants to honor. But that, that framework 
um, called the Five R's of Real Integration was actually designed by students in New York City public school students from the organization called Integrate NYC. They've been, they started in the South Bronx and they really, they, this is their analysis of, of segregation. And they say it's, it's not just about separating people from each other, it's about separating people from resources. It's about separating us from our history, from our curriculum that is really should be ours. And it's about, you know, it's, you know so for, that, for our young people, it's really about a comprehensive framework that does include a lot of these pieces. I think our young people would say that every single New York City public school that is a truly integrated school would offer an Afrocentric curriculum, would offer a Chicanx and a Latinx curriculum mm -hmm. and, and culturally, mm -hmm. ethnically responsive uh, approaches and so that framework was used by the school diversity advisory group uh, which I'm a member of and a number of our students are and so we we advocated to adopt that framework as the policy approach to the city we have heard zero from the mayor or the chancellor on that but we do know that at least rhetorically Chancellor Carranza um, and and in some of the initiatives around anti-bias training that they've invested in we do know that there's alignment there but we all right so Lurie you yeah. advise a lot of schools yes I don't see you jumping out of your chair excited about <laughs> um, I think we just have to start with the premise that all schools are culturally responsive. The question right. is to whose culture are they right. responding? Right. That's right. And whether That's you right. are in a predominantly white specialized high school or predominantly Asian specialized high school or a black school in East New York, um, the culture of the curriculum, the culture for discipline, the culture for evaluation mm -hmm. of what is an effective teacher versus what is not centers white culture. That's right. The difference between a school like Ember, um, which I have proudly supported Supported, well, I'll be perfectly honest, um, from their inception, is that they are centering the needs, the educational, academic, and cultural learning needs of black and brown children. And what does that mean? White children who are the descendant of those who owned people and who are entitled with privilege and power have a very different educational need base than do mm -hmm. black and Latinx children who were owned, who were property, and who have been relegated to the subsector of society. And every scholar who has studied black education from an African Senate perspective has started with that understanding. And so it is one wonderful to have a plan that focuses on the redistribution of resources. I have often advocated we need equitable resources. Mm -hmm. All of this other stuff is fluff. <laughs> Give That's us right. access to That's equitable right. resources yeah. or don't prevent us getting access That's from right. equitable resources. And we're having a very different conversation. Right. Give us more on the don't prevent us part. Well, when you have policies that are going to center a specialized high school and ignore a school like, say, a Medgarver's Prep, which mm -hmm. has been producing numbers that have been astronomical for black and brown mm -hmm. students for decades. They don't have a gym. The students are right. playing in the hallways. The DOE yep. has promised them facilities for years, and for years they have waited and, and been left to squander. Meanwhile, they're producing academic outcomes that rival, if not exceed, those of the specialized high schools. Mm -hmm. The children are graduating high school with an associate's degree. They're finishing their high school regions in middle school, and yet it is a school that has been largely ignored in Brooklyn, the, right. the, one of the largest congregations of Pan-African descendant people mm -hmm. outside of Brazil and the continent of Africa. So when that's the disparity, and when a Stuyvesant can get access to what they get access to, and when a Medgar Evers prep is having to deal with the, right. the oppression that they deal with but can still overcome, that is a systematic disinvestment right. choice that if there were not that choice being made, we wouldn't have to have a conversation mm. about whether or not we should be integrating because the school would be able to have the ability to fund its needs and to fund its children's mm. futures. And we didn't actually say that white kids won't go to Afrocentric schools, but they is there evidence, any they evidence should. they will? Well, I mean, I've had a few students enroll in our school for sure. I mean, it, um, my children they, attended African-centered schools mm -hmm. with white children present. Right. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I think so as we think about kind of like what's next, I mean, Larie kind of mentioned this. We have to focus on the people who are the stewards for education and learning. We have to focus on teachers. And right now, their training and then the expectations that are courted by the traditional public school system. And I would say this is true for charter schools. And I would say this is true for private schools. It centers whiteness yes. Yes. in a way that reinforces white supremacy and white hegemony. And so until we disrupt that, right, until we say, you know, we actually need a fundamental shift in the way that we think about difference and the way we think about culture writ large. And so I think that for that's a part of our work that we're looking forward to doing as we kind of stand up and grow our particular school and our particular service. But it must begin with that as an idea of diversity can't just be about being proximate. Right. We're proximate on the subway every That's day. That's right. Mm -hmm. We're proximate we on yet, plantations. We're proximate on plantations, <laughs> right? We're proximate. <laughs> right. We've always been proximate. It is the thinking, it is the mindset yes. that is the problem. We haven't talked about funding, though, at the federal level and the way that schools are funded district by district dependent on the um, land tax base. Yeah. So is I would, any of this fixable if we don't fix <clears throat> that? Well, I think, again, 
the reason genius. So when she talked about <laughs> when she you. when she no seriously when when she highlights the the, the disparity right and they, they both highlight this disparity. If you look at schools that serve black and brown kids, they are the least invested in. Yep. And so then the question is, what is the role of government? Government is supposed to be the interveners when it comes to these kind of societal problems. And so whether it's the federal government or the state government, neither seems pretty interested in solving this, what I would call the resource gap. Mm -hmm. I know, look, I have a charter school, charter schools supposedly get all this money. We're supposed, <laughs> my school is one of the least funded public schools in the state. I don't receive a single private dollar. I don't receive, we, the number of public funds that we get are still less than even our traditional counterparts. And so I think we have to sit back and say, are we interested in investing in the future of our society? Because the future is, and the present is, mm -hmm. black and brown. What's the story we will tell the future of this moment around these decisions, Lurie? Hopefully it's that we learned the lessons from the past 65 years of brown mm. and decided to go a different way. Those of us who are advocating for integration, I support that fight. It cannot be the fight that sucks all the air out of the room mm. because for those of us who live in communities that are not going to see schools integrated, our children deserve access to the resources and a culturally responsive education that will center them and it will require their educators to master the principles and best practices in culturally and responsive right. education so that the outcomes are in tandem with what the expectations would be. The recent scandal around Wow, shocking, cheating in Ooh. college admissions <laughs> by people Merit. with influence and power, <laughs> including some Hollywood celebrities. Yeah. Mm. Has that helped or hurt this conversation? It's given some attention mm. to it. I don't know if people are making this connection between these kind of the, 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 the functions of kind of inequality and privilege that, that operate in kind of these elite educational spaces and, and what's happening in our kind of public educational uh, spaces for, the, for our K-12 students. I'm not, I'm, 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 I've been thinking a lot about this, obviously. I attended Columbia University after attending a, Hispanically, a historic Hispanic serving institution in Los Angeles and was completely culture shocked every single day. I walked in there to see like the eight other students of color. Um, so I, I see that connection clearly. I'm hopeful uh, other brilliant people will make those connections for larger society to see, but it's very much related. I mean, the, the specialized high school conversation um, has so much resonance and relevance to this this you know now i'm not suggesting yeah, that people yeah. are cheating their way into specialized high schools but there is a, a a a game to play to get into these and if you figure out how to play that game right. you can get that scarce resource that is you know supposedly so amazing the game we're all in is our shared future mm -hmm. right what are we going to do thank you so much all of you thank and you. and thank i want to say that we recently decided to take a look for ourselves and visited the ember school in bedford stuyvesant a Brooklyn neighborhood long known as a center of political black power. Mm. We wanted to see exactly how Ember operates <laughs> and hear directly from teachers and students themselves. So thank you for having us. No, thank you for coming out to visit us. Here's what we found. Today you had an opportunity to see family meeting. It's really about our family here at Ember. It's also about the family of the diaspora. Like our school is two thirds black, one third Latinx. And so part of our approach to be a culturally responsive is that we speak to everyone who is here. Because a lot of people live in this um, nation and I also chose to do to make a part in so everyone can be happy. And so this is our time once a week where we get to talk about our intersectionality. We get to talk about the big ideas, the concepts, the history that connects all of us to this shared experience that we've had all over the world. Marcus Garvey said, Red, black, and green. Palenque, You look at their faces, you listen to their voices, you hear them express the sense of pride and knowledge. It's beautiful. This, this is why I do this work. Everything that we decorate our school with, we aim to really um, create a culture that kind of reflects the culture that is at home, you know? So we put things up that really makes them proud of who they are. So like Sister Raquel spent hours kind of like creating all these different flags and they're not just flags on the wall. 
they are really representative of all the kids that are in our school. It's really important that this institution um, validates who our kids are as, as something that's important. Now, when I'm reading a problem, I want to be able to do what with this information? Sanaya? When you, when you first read one sentence, you can make a visual in your head or a picture. Yes, you can make a visual or a picture, right? So if you look at all the social movements, where everything from the civil rights movement to the Nation of Islam to the Black Panthers, it was all about self-empowerment. So the question was, how do we put that at the center of school? And you don't. This is not a school. I know it looks like a school, but this is not a school. This is not what this is. This is a human development organization, and in that way, we're much more like a consulting firm. And people come to us with the problem. The problem is that they are in bondage, they are enslaved, they're trapped in generational poverty. And their kids are as well, and they want us to help them break those chains. And we know that that can only be done by them. That's why it's about empowerment. That's why it's about mindset. And so we have to do that in this place that we call school buildings. But we can do that anywhere by helping our staff and, and, and our teachers, our human development practitioners, start to step into that role, into that footing, now we're doing some really revolutionary work. I think now we're doing some things to kind of challenge what we typically called education. I don't know if everyone's gonna support that, but I think if you want a healthy, vibrant democracy, you should demand that. You know, we talk about being Harry Tubman. We talk about this as the Underground Railroad, right? We talk about like, this is a pathway to freedom and you gotta build it, you gotta operationalize it. And I think that's what we've been doing here and that's what we'll continue to do.